Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Parkhill. Uh, I'm the CEO here at uh, here of ACON, uh, the community organisation where Alan has worked for the last five years. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone today uh, and thank you all for coming along to, to honour the life uh, and work of Alan Brotherton. I'd like to start this afternoon by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on this afternoon, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. Um, a, a slight housekeeping note, it would be great if people could please either switch off their phones or, or turn them to silent. <coughs> Alan was certainly an unforgettable presence in the lives of many people here in Australia and indeed throughout the world. And news of his passing was met with great sadness by friends and colleagues in the professional and personal dimensions he chose to inhabit. In fact, when we posted the news on the ACON social media pages, they generated perhaps the biggest response that we've ever received, which I really think marks, in a, in a, in a very contemporary way, uh, the impact of Alan's work uh, and that of Alan's character. Uh, for the loss and their loss, uh, we extend our deepest sympathies to, to Alan's partner, Luke, uh, as well of his family uh, and his, his very close and dear friendships. Uh, they will remember Alan for a, multi a multitude of personal reasons, some of which I'm, here, I'm sure we'll all hear about this afternoon. But Alan will also be remembered by his peers, his colleagues and his community as one of Australia's leading HIV and GLBTI advocates. Through his dedicated service of over more than 30 years, Alan made a significant contribution to improving the lives of LGBT people and people affected by HIV here in Australia and throughout the world. In this regard, we have all benefited from Alan's uncompromising principles, his integrity, his impassion, his fierce intelligence and intellect, his wonderful sense of humour and his unique and illuminating view of the world. Alan was a truly remarkable person and he'll be greatly missed by us all at ACON, uh, but more broadly across the HIV and health sectors in New South Wales and Australia and internationally. Today provides us with an opportunity to focus and reflect on the side of Alan's life, many aspects of Alan's life and pay tribute to the valued, valued legacy he leaves behind. Today you'll hear from several speakers with direct knowledge of Alan's work uh, and the first one of those is Bill Whitaker. Bill is one of the architects of Australia's response to HIV and AIDS and has worked in the HIV policy and strategy arena for close to 30 years. Bill knew and worked with Alan since the early 1990s through countless committees, boards and organisations involved in the Australian HIV response. They both worked closely during the formative years of Australia's uh, initial, initial crisis response where they joined the HIV activist movement in the fights for rights, dignity, health, treatment and care. These were often tumultuous times as the impact of the HIV epidemic was hitting here hard, both here in Australia and internationally. Bill is going to talk to us today about some of Alan's many contributions during these initial times of the crisis. Thanks, Bill. Thank you very much, Nick, and hello, everyone. It's really wonderful to see such a, uh, a good turnout, and one could only imagine if all Alan's admirers and friends from around the world, we'd fill a number of these venues with, with the crowd that would turn up. I think it goes without saying that there's, of course, many facets that make up a person and a life, and one of the many facets that uh, characterised our friend Alan Brotherston was his formidable work and reputation as a passionate and effective activist. An activist in the fight against AIDS, an activist in the fight against discrimination, and an activist in the fight for equality and dignity for the GLBTI community. This is the capacity, Alan the activist, that I knew Alan best for. We met some 23 years ago when he, like so many other gay men, became involved in the fight against AIDS. One thing that struck me as I thought about what I might say today was how young Alan was when he first got involved as a volunteer in the community response to HIV back in the early 90s. He was only in his 20s, but he jumped right into the middle of things, into the middle of activism. 
Today there are a lot more good news stories about HIV than in the time that Alan first got involved. Also, finding openly HIV positive people to take on leadership, to be publicly out about being HIV positive, was often exceptionally difficult. There was a lot of stigma and discrimination directed at people with HIV and affected in communities. HIV positive leaders would rather too often be greeted with a kind of condescension when demanding to be listened to and to have a place at the decision-making table, or even dismissed as mad or unwell. Alan started working in HIV around 1992, joining the Board of Positive Living New South Wales, now called Positive Life. He joined up as a volunteer and went on to the board. The organisation was in a pretty fragile state in those years, having lost many members and leaders to AIDS. Soon after getting on, going on the board, Alan was elected convener of the organisation and he set about strengthening its structure and its strategic capacity and making sure that Positive Life as the voice of people with HIV in New South Wales had a place at the decision-making table. This meant dealing with some very pressing things, like having enough beds at St Vincent's Hospital, for example. It also meant advocating for uh, better systems of HIV health care, both in the hospital system and in community-based care. Alan really understood what worked and what didn't in the health system, and these insights served him very well back in the 1990s and indeed throughout his long career in Australia and internationally. Being a leader, being an openly gay, HIV-positive leader, is not always easy, and it was especially not easy at the time that Alan was convener of Positive Life New South Wales in the early 90s. And also during the mid-90s, when he moved to national pro prominence as president of the National Association of People Living with HIV Australia. <clears throat> so I think I should say just a few things about the environment of that time when Alan was so centrally involved. The first half of the 1990s were, in my opinion, the bleakest of any period in the HIV epidemic. We had no effective treatments for HIV except AZT. The pace of research and treatment development seemed exceptionally slow. Clinical research was being thwarted by a Byzantine clinical trial system in Australia, and treatment developing, de development um, was agonisingly slow. And HIV-positive people, while this was going on, were all getting sick, very sick, and they were dying in large numbers. So there was a lot of grief and loss at the time. As well as grief and loss and sadness, there was also a lot of anger at what was happening to our communities. That anger was sometimes misdirected at ourselves and at our community leaders. This could be very hard indeed. Last year, Alan was a keynote speaker at the 30th anniversary of the National Association of People with HIV, NAPWA. During this address, he took the opportunity to reflect on the 1990s, during which time Alan was an important leader of Australia's HIV response. In Alan's talk, he summarised the highs and lows of activism in the 90s in his typically insightful way. He said that, looked at in hindsight, that decade seems a chaotic mix of disbelief, optimism, cynicism, elation and even fear. He went on to wryly observe that some people simply ran for cover. It was all just too much for them. Well, Alan never ran for cover. Some strategic weaving and ducking, maybe. We all did that. That's why many of us are still here. But Alan's determined and effective leadership in the HIV community during those really difficult years was so important. I saw this at first hand, having served with him as NAPWA's treatments and research convener during those years that Alan was president of NAPWA. Of course, the second half of the 1990s was the antithesis of the first half. Despair and frustration about lack of progress was replaced with tremendous enthusiasm and as major scientific advances were made, new, new HIV monitoring tests became available and new HIV drugs became available all in a rush. Getting access to these tests and treatments and getting information out to people with HIV and those at high risk 
became an extremely urgent and pressing priority. Once again, Alan's leadership, insight and determination helped support the work of many activists to overcome these barriers to access. Alan also provided a lot of sound advice to governments and scientists through his membership of many national HIV advisory committees, which, unlike the committees of today, actually produced a lot of good work and meaningfully reflected that HIV partnership of positive people, affected communities, governments, scientists and health professionals. Alan understood that effective acti activism isn't only about shouting, demanding and banging at the table. It's also about reasoned yet forceful arguments and ideas. Alan understood that activism is of course about placards, civil disobedience, rallying and demanding action in a very vocal way. However, it's also about building a case, thinking outside the box, careful planning, and Alan recognised this. And his formidable intellect and presence provided an important bridge between what I will call in-your-face activism on the one hand, and the equally important, sophisticated, highly researched and planned approach on the other. The latter is, of course, often less apparent to the general public, but it is so necessary to make advocacy successful. So I'm going to pause there and hand over to colleagues to cover some of the, the other aspects of Alan's wonderful story. However, I do hope in these few minutes today I've been able to share with you some insights into how Alan operated and what motivated him during his early years as an activist. I've chosen to do this rather than give you a recitation of his many roles as an activist and of the many boards and committees he served on, because in the end, the only thing that matters are the results that are achieved, and Alan achieved results in spades. Finally, it would be very hard, if not impossible, for Alan to have achieved so much over such a long period without the support of such a wonderful group of friends. And their love and respect and admiration has been expressed in so many touching ways since his passing. As uh, Nick said, we'll all miss Alan's insight, his humanity, his fundamental decency and his wicked sense of humour. Alan's life inspires us to do better. And it is an honour to be asked to speak at Alan's memorial today. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Daryl O'Donnell, the Executive Director at the Mental Health Commission of New South Wales. Daryl and Alan met in 1995 during the early heady days of FAO's Gay Education Strategies Project. They built a friendship as their intersecting paths took them across the country in different directions. They worked together at the Victorian AIDS Council in the late 1990s and were compatriots across the community bureaucratic divide in the early 2000s when Alan was at ACON and Daryl was at the New South Wales Ministry of Health. Alan joined Daryl at the ministry in the mid 2000s. Most recently, Alan and Daryl worked together at ACON. Alan is Director of Policy, Strategy and Research and Daryl is a board member. Daryl will speak about Alan's more recent HIV and LGBTI health work. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Uh, memory uh, is a wonderful thing. It's precious, comforting, and it's also fragile. In my first clear memory of Alan, we were at a FAO. He's standing some way off, facing towards me. There's no one else in this memory. There's a striking physicality about him. He's solid and broad in my mind. He isn't wearing his stubbies, but rather a purple shirt with white polka dots. I know my memory must play tricks here. That shirt must come later. But it so characterises my sense of Alan's studied flamboyance that I've transposed it back to that first memory. Whatever short a shirt he wore, he was striking, and I was fascinated. Alan and I would go on to work beside each other for years in different places and different organisations. When I saw him at AFAO, he would have been a member of the Australian National Council on AIDS and about to become NAPWA president. I must have known him when I worked for NAPWA a few years earlier, but I can't quite recall. In 1995, he was in Sydney and I was visiting from Melbourne. I'd shortly moved to Perth and we came to know one another through the endless forums, conferences, working groups and committees that brought all of us together in our far-flung responses to HIV. 
I arrived back in Melbourne in 1997 to work for the People Living with HIV program at La Trobe, and at that time, Alan was VAC GMHC's education manager. I joined the board and later the staff at VAC as a policy analyst, and we got to work together directly as colleagues at the same organisation for the first time. Alan returned to Sydney in mid-1998 to head up the newly established, newly integrated AFAO and NAPWA education team. Bringing together programs for positive and negative gay men, finding common purpose while celebrating difference, was something Alan was exceptionally well placed to do. In the sometimes intensive uh, zero divides of the 90s, I never felt unsafe with Alan. He always made room for difference. I moved to Sydney six months after Alan, and for a time he provided a roof for me. I was Melbourne through and through, barely out of black, experimenting awkwardly with colour, and not one for beaches or even really sunlight for that matter. <laughs> and here I'd find myself shuttling from a fayo up comforting dingy Oxford Street, home to Alan's luridly bright 50s style Bronte flat. There's a moment on that bus ride at the top of McPherson Street where the, sm the salt smell of the ocean hits you and you breathe and the grime leaves you. And then you see the ocean. It was a journey to another place. Time would slow and perspective would change. By the time Alan left Sydney for Adelaide, I was at the New South Wales Ministry of Health. It was in Adelaide, of course, that Alan and Luke met at the closing party for the Gale Warning Frock Salon. Luke shared recently that they'd talked for hours that night, as they did for the next 15 years. When Alan and Luke arrived in Sydney in March 2002, we were able to return Alan's earlier favour and they stayed with Tom and I at Elizabeth Bay for a time. Alan now worked for ACON as Director of Client Services where he continued the careful transition of HIV services from their crisis settings to something that uh, more, more contemporary. In time, I tempted him on an adventure into the ministry. Bureaucracy is a funny thing. Bureaucrats act with the blunt brawn of the state and so brains really aren't required, but gee, they help. There was nothing as delicious as watching Alan skewer a dense, technically complex project, especially one enmeshed in interpersonal or organisational politics. There was a kind of sport in the ministry in those days where the most recent arrival would get the crappiest, most painful things to do. Alan's was a minimum data set for HIV ambulatory care. We wanted to know how much activity was being provided via area health services and who for, and Alan was the one to do it. Alan's intellectual prowess was really something to behold. It's wrapped up intimately in my first memory of him at AFAO. His undergraduate training was sociology, a discipline that leads to no obvious job, but that teaches one to think deeply and critically about the world. It's a discipline that's decidedly leftist and concerned for questions of power and status and of equality and of social justice. Alan brought the deep conceptual capacity and analytic rigor of a sociologist together with his own, or perhaps his Teutonic, pincer-like technical grasp. He knew the power of crisp, clear data, and he knew what happens when you place that carefully at the heart of a well-woven argument. He could definitely bring those things together and wield them with skill. There were times when that was hard. He could be famously grumpy, irritable, and impatient. There were times when he'd be coming to meet with me at work and I'd brace myself. But mostly he was caring, passionate, conscientious, curious, adroit, and funny. He was the person that you wanted to have on your side. Lisa Ryan, who worked with us in the ministry, reminded me recently of Alan's doorstops by her office, where his sole purpose was to tell her, once again, that Luke was the best boyfriend in the world. Not said neutrally, but with conviction and a need that you should not, 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 that you should not only know this, but understand it and feel it as he did. By the time Alan was done negotiating with the area health services, a little minimum data set was producing the best community health intelligence in New South Wales. Alan had the respect of all those who'd played. There were many other things, notable things that Alan led in the ministry, from the Safe Sex No Regrets TV campaign to the management of NGO grants, the revision of funding formulas and the approval of area budgets. It doesn't sound very sexy, a far cry one might think from the theatre of community life, but these were exciting times and the work mattered. Our community needed a strong, competent and challenging bureaucratic partner and Alan was simply outstanding in the role. But he was also ambivalent. Community life isn't the only theatre around. For community activists coming into the bureaucracy, such as Alan and I and so many others now and in the past, there's a deep performance that's required. One's power comes from one's credibility and that in turn uh, comes from one's assumption of the role. There are compromises to be made. 
you occupy the role at the expense of autonomy, the ability to speak and act freely. How we face those compromises is a deeply personal matter. And Alan felt, not always, but certainly in his later time with the ministry, that that cost was high. Besides, a global stage awaited. Alan joined his friend Susie McLean at the International AIDS Alliance in 2008, and later Robin Gorner at the International AIDS Society. When he returned home, he returned to ACON, and we worked together for the last time, Alan as Director of Policy, Strategy and Research, and myself now as a board member. Alan's prodigious capability was again serving our community. He crafted outstanding strategies for ACON's work beyond HIV in areas such as mental health, drug and alcohol, and homophobic and transphobic violence. Veronica Ulate shared with me some guide notes that Alan had created for discussants at an ACON Big Day In Forum on gender and sexism in LGBTI communities. He says in the notes that our communities have a complex and challenging relationship with notions of gender, that we resist and subvert, but also at times we confirm, we desire, we reinforce dominant norms. He then provides us with some comfort, acknowledging that we are shaped by our environments and by our upbringing. And he points to the ways that others classify us, often with transphobic or homophobic motives, the stereotypes they perpetuate and the silence this can create in our own relationships and in our communities. And finally, he enjoins us to discuss how our communities are shaped and impacted by gender inequality, and also to celebrate the immense capacity that we have to challenge and to change those influences. In a few short paragraphs, Alan's laid out for us a clear but nuanced path. He's acknowledged us and he's challenged us. It is, for me, classic Alan, an illustration of his capacity to examine an issue carefully and to invite us to do so with him, to draw in many perspectives, including those that are not his own, in order to achieve a deeper understanding, while never stepping away from his deep convictions about human rights and about social justice. It must have been at the Ministry, or maybe a little earlier, when the first book from Alan arrived in my letterbox. It was his copy of Everyday Life Under Nazism. It arrived after a discussion we'd had at dinner about our shared fascination with daily life in times of crisis. When bad things are happening, how do people get through? And then the book arrived. He'd been thinking of me. He thought I'd enjoy it. I promised myself for years that I'd read it, but in time I lost it to my great guilt. Years later, another book arrived following another discussion at another dinner. This one was called Pirates of Barbary, Corsairs, Conquests and Captivity in the 17th Century Mediterranean. Alan was a very widely read man. I promised myself again that I'd read it, and I never have. I opened it after Alan died to try and understand why on earth he'd given it to me, and I found his card inside. It says in part, here's the book I was telling you about, a fascinating romp. My favourite voice-off editorial lies near the top of page 149. And on page 149, in a chapter called Woeful Slavery, William Rainborough's 1637 Expedition to Morocco, the following aside is offered in parenthesis. The notion that Turks used men to gratify their sexual desires merely because they couldn't find suitable women suggests the writer was woefully ignorant of human sexuality or that he was a sailor. <laughs> There's a particular comfort that our memories give us. When people are taken from us, our memories help us to hold them close, to feel their presence and to have them with us again. And the act of memory, the will to recall and to not forget, helps us to keep them alive. For me, it's Alan and that polka dot shirt, that strong frame, that fierce intellect, that enduring friendship with me and with so many others whose lives intersected ours or that I've met through him, that deep conviction and passion and that belief in justice that I will remember and hold with me, and in holding that, feel grateful that I knew him. Thank you, Daryl. Our next two speakers are Robin Gorner and Susie McLean, uh, and they'll be appearing today uh, via a video they produced in London this week. Uh, Robin currently lives between Brighton in the UK and Geneva in Switzerland, where she is Executive Director of Partnerships for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health with the UN. Robin met Alan in 1998 when they worked together at AFAO. They worked together again when Robin was Executive Director at the International AIDS Society. Susie is a senior HIV and harm reduction specialist and works internationally on HIV at the International HIV Alliance. 
She's been part of the community response to HIV since 1986 when she worked at the Victorian AIDS Council Gay Men's Health Centre, at a FAO in the late 90s and at the National AIDS Trust in the UK in the early 2000s before moving to the Alliance. Uh, she has worked with and been friends with Alan since 1996. Uh, Robin and Susie will speak about uh, Alan's uh, work in the international space. Nineties is fine. Yeah, must have been because I came. When summer, did you come? summer of ninety-eight. Right. Okay. He'd been there a couple of months. Okay. Uh, so my name is Susie McLean, um, and I met Alan in the round about the mid to late 90s, a crucial time really in terms of the uh, history of HIV treatment access. And I met him when I first moved to Sydney to work at AFEO. I was the PLHA policy officer and Alan was the president of NAPWA. Rusty Westercott was the coordinator or something, NAPWA. So the three of us worked very close together. We became instant friends straight away. And I'm Robin Gorner and I moved to Australia in the middle of 1998 and met Alan with Susie and Rusty. Um, and at that time I think he'd just started in a FAO heading up the gay men's education. He'd moved on from being NAPWA president. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we had such a laugh together. We didn't always see eye to eye because we both knew we were right uh, a lot of the time and, and not always on the right side of or the same side of the argument. But he was he was such an incredible inspiration and it was quite challenging for me being in Australia. Those huge personalities and extraordinary history of the work that had been done and just how successful the positive movement was um, compared to the UK where the positive movement had started to kind of wane and was no longer at the centre. Right. And he was just a brilliant advocate. I learned so much about advocacy from him and all the work he was pushing forward. And we never needed to say you had to have GPA or any of this stuff because it was just in his bones and in the way we all work together. Mm. Yeah, a friend and colleague, Marsha Rosengarten Talks, has this beautiful line. He taught me a lot about how to think about HIV. And in those mm. terms, you know, it's, again, it's not as if you would, out of political correctness, you know... Um, the driver wasn't that thing about political correctness. It was like that kind of insight that you got yeah. from him about the lived experience of HIV or the lived experience of treatment or of, you know, talking about anal sex with your doctor or talking about, you know, empowerment with your friends or whatever was very th kind of deep and thoughtful mm. and the kind of thing you would, you would never want to not have in your work or in your well in your own understandings yeah I like the way he was never kind of dramatic or it wasn't about self-aggrandizement he would talk very openly and honestly and always with so much humor as well mm. you know even when he could be incredibly grumpy and forthright at times but there was he disarmed people by always using that very very open commentary about the most bodily aspects of what he was living with and also just the thoughtfulness. I mean, the intellect was extraordinary and that uniting of his phenomenal intelligence, incredibly diverse understanding, both sort of personally and politically and professionally. And, and then this sort of sense of humor that could completely knock you off your, off your high horse if you were trying to have a, an argument with him about something. He, he, he was genuinely always right and mm, except for that. Often hilarious, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Many years passed. I left Sydney um, to come to London. I eventually ended up at the International HIV AIDS Alliance. And then um, Alan came and joined the Alliance. And I wanted to say a few words about that because it's quite an amazing organisation. And in all, of, in all of that kind of hugeness and diversity, Alan made a very strong mark in just a couple of years. So it's an international network of organisations working in about 40 countries and there's only so much you can do. There are many sub-themes, there are many countries and many different cultural issues. But Ellen honed in on some really interesting work. So there was the start-up of some work with MSM, transgender people in uh, North Africa, Middle East, North Africa, and he was very instrumental in getting that work off the ground. The work's now flourishing, there's thriving MSM organisations in that part of the world and Alan was very much part of um, our contribution to getting those networks off the ground. Um, 
on you mentioned about his um, advocacy skills. He the, he had a he was working in the policy team, and he had a really um, distinctive interest in a, again in a very thoughtful way about the practice of advocacy mm. and its very many faces and forms in different parts of the world. And as a result of that interest in the practice of advocacy, he did some very focused work with some people in India and with a colleague here from the UK on advocacy evaluation. There's a tool called Measuring Up that's still um, very much a popular and live tool. We just did a big multi-country advocacy planning exercise. We've got money for a big five-year advocacy, HIV advocacy program, and we were using just in the last few weeks the concepts and the ideas from the um, Measuring Up tool that Alan produced. You know, the Alliance has always had a strong uh, interest and investment in the net key population networks and in growing those networks in various countries. And he made a particularly, he was the kind of focal point for us, for our relationship with the sex worker networks, including in Latin America and the transgender networks in Latin America, but also the global networks and was very uh, involved in the early days in the establishment of the Global MSM Forum, which many of us now know as a thriving global network. And that's kind of when our paths crossed again, because I stole Alan from the International AIDS Alliance. <laughs> I'd moved out of Sydney um, after about five years and went through various things in my career and ended up running the International AIDS Society. And when I was brought in, I was told that the thing they wanted was to shift the organisation from just being about running the big AIDS conferences to also having a bigger advocacy footprint and to make sure that we use the 14,000 members as advocates, as professionals, not just as people coming to conferences. Yeah, right. And um, and I sat and I thought, who on earth can I find to be head of advocacy and comms? Because we didn't have an advocacy team then. And I thought around everyone I'd met over the years in all the different parts of the world, and the only person I could think of who had that brilliance and that intelligence and, and understanding was Alan. And also I found that the IAS didn't have anyone openly living with HIV there. It was bizarre. Here was this international aid society and they had no politics and they had no reality of it. So went through a big headhunter process, but I always knew I wanted Alan. And of course he came through shining. Um, and uh, yeah, it was amazing to bring him on board. And incredible how it transformed the understanding in the organisation. People were completely blown away by his skill and his talent. Yeah, and so, you know, we're sitting here in our kitchen overlooking our garden and Alan spent a lot of time here when he first moved to the UK. He was kind of here for a few months and then he was back here just weeks ago, him and Luke. And, um, yeah, so in addition to all of that fine work, there's a thousand fine memories of the dinners that we had, the wine that we drank, the fun that we had, the music that we played. Um, yeah, I really do think he was one of the world's great bon vivants. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll never drink German Riesling <laughs> ever again without thinking of him. Nor will I eat Spanish food with, you know, without thinking of him. Um, yeah, his many cuisines, his love of sausage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes on and on, his many enthusiasms. Yeah. It's uh, very inspiring. You're right, Suze, that kind of bon vivant side of him was so inspiring. And I often think that the most eclectic sides of my music collection come from Alan Brotherton. And I've been listening to so much of that recently, and it just, well, he sits with me um, and will do forever as I listen to that. But I also think, you know, he'll sit with me professionally. He changed so much of how I think and operate in my professional world. And I know he did that for thousands, millions of people's lives he touched in the end through the ways in which he worked. Um, he was a true global health pioneer, as well as a dear friend. Yeah, and I'm conscious that in a few weeks, or two weeks I think it is, um, everybody will be gathering together in his name in Sydney. Of course, we'd love to be there, and so this little film is um, our attempt to try to be there as much as we can, but um, I think one of the big things that I really wanted to get across was that uh, Alan has an international network that goes on and on. His footprint was genuinely and kind of profoundly international. Um, but the, the, the 
character character of it was um, up close and personal and um, down to earth and gritty, as well as uh, thoughtful and profound. So it's quite a it's quite a footprint and. Then in addition to that, he was also our friend. And so um, in amongst all the sadness, I feel blessed and lucky. Uh, thank you to both Robin and Susie for that. And I might just mention too that um, as we're meeting here today, uh, Robin is hosting a breakfast in Geneva with a lot of um, Alan's colleagues that he worked with um, internationally uh, at the same time that we're meeting here this afternoon. Um, our next speaker is Bill O'Loughlin, uh, who met Alan in the early 90s when they were both involved at a national level in the community response to HIV. At that time, Bill was appointed to represent the community on the federal advisory body, the National Council on AIDS. And soon after, Alan was also appointed to represent people living with HIV. In the mid-90s, Bill was the president of AFAO when Alan was the president of NAPWA. They were colleagues who then became friends. Bill delivered the eulogy at Alan's funeral and will speak again today about Alan's wonderful, unique character and enduring friendships. Alan was my friend, and now he is dead. It is a dreadful honour to give the eulogy for a friend. <clears throat> we are left with only words, and they seem so tiny against the magnitude of the loss of such a special, remarkable and loved man. As I wandered around Melbourne over the past week, thinking about what I could say this afternoon, I let my mind play back through our friendship. My memories of Alan, <clears throat> the things we did together, the conversations we had, the adventures we each had, and which would tumble out as we spoke, egging each other on with story after story. And the laughter. Always with Alan, the laughter. I knew that I would tell some of these stories now, and yet I didn't want to. They are private. In the weeks since Alan died, things have shifted for me. The reality that he has, is dead has sunk in. He has gone from my life and all I am left with is memories. And part of me wants to keep them for myself, to reminisce about, to make me smile, to inspire me to live a fuller life, and especially to be grateful for the years of friendship that he gave to me. He was an important part of my life. He would often begin a phone call by saying, something funny has just happened and it made me think of you and I just have to tell you. So now I'm reluctant to talk about those stories in public, yet this is what is demanded when someone dies. We need to pay tribute to him, and so the personal and private becomes public. At his funeral I spoke of knowing that soon after we met, Alan had decided we would be friends, and that then, ever after, he acted as he believed a good friend would act. And I said that I knew he was my friend because he kept demonstrating it. Later, his friend Jake and a number of his other friends came up to me and said that is exactly what happened to them. They said it was a lovely description of how they experienced Alan's friendship. I met Alan in the early 90s and it was a terrible time. It was the dying years of the HIV epidemic, the time when its impact hit hard and person after person died. My first memory of Alan comes from when we were both on an important committee. Its meetings were serious and proper, requiring hard advocacy and politicking. My first clear memory of Alan is of both of us in the lift going down for a smoke break and laughing uproariously at the quirks of some of the people around the table and what we had just sat through. It symbolises what our friendship came to typify. We sat in that meeting and we were tuned into its purpose and what needed to be done but there in the back of our minds was another train of thinking that was picking up on the oddities, the quirks and the amusing aspects. We kept a straight face, 
but once in private, in that lift, those observations came flying out and made us roar laughing. Our friendship was off and running. I have a constant, tangible reminder of Alan's friendship, which is part of my daily life. Long ago, back in those 90s, Alan gave me a pencil sharpener for Christmas. It came out of the blue and he said something to the effect of, I've got something for you for Christmas because it made me think of you. It's a small plastic black and white cow with a hole under its tail for inserting the pencil. It has been on my, my desk ever since. Whenever I use it, whenever I stick a pencil up that cow's bum, I find myself wondering, what is it about this that made Alan think of me? <laughs> and each time I use it, I smile. We both had HIV, in fact, I still do. Alan became infected when he was quite young, and again, in typical Alan fashion, he largely took that in his stride. As Russell Westacott commented recently, Alan was distinctive as a HIV activist for never trading on his HIV status. In public, in politics, and in advocacy, Alan was well able to mount an argument on its merits. Our friendship was rooted in sharing how to live with HIV and, back then, of living with the likelihood that we would soon be dead. We didn't speak so much of the difficulty of living with HIV, but we shared a way of living, of trying to live as best we could with the prospect of death. We both knew what each was doing in our HIV work, but we didn't really discuss that much. Instead, we, stole, we told stories, we shared our adventures, we made each other laugh, and together, without stating as much, we affirmed each other and it helped us to keep going, to keep living despite the horror around us. People often comment how in death, someone suddenly becomes perfect and all their faults seem to disappear. So let's make it clear. Alan had some quite difficult sides to his character. I learned how to adjust the friendship and how to manage that side of him. I took this in my stride, as did I suspect many of his friends. And let me also be clear, Alan had the most astonishing circle of friends, true friends, and people who are in their own right quite remarkable. And this, I believe, is the true mark of a good life. Partly I think the difficulty Alan sometimes experienced was due to his phenomenal intelligence, his remarkable energy, his capacity to work hard and to accomplish many things. One of the ways that this intelligence manifested was the ease with which Alan could quickly pick up on a foreign language. He was particularly proud of his facility with Spanish, but even he had to admit that his skills sometimes let him down. Once when at the Alliance, he was organising a global meeting and wanted to invite a prominent Latin American woman as a keynote speaker. Alan confidently decided that he would write to her in his excellent Spanish. And so he sent off a formal invitation in which he stated in Spanish, we would like to pleasure ourselves as you speak. <laughs> because we lived in different cities, much of our friendship happened by phone. A number of times over the last few years, Alan phoned me just as he left his doctor, often when the news was disappointing or bleak. He would call just to talk. He would tell me what the doctor had told him. He wouldn't be dramatic, but would say something like, it doesn't look good. And that was enough. We would then just quietly share its significance and impact. But the other and probably main reason why Alan would call me was to help prepare himself for then telling Luke and his parents about the bad news. He would talk with me about this and how to handle it because he wanted to care for them as he told them. At other times, there were the texts Alan would send on a special occasion, New Year's Eve, for example. He would write that he was in a beautiful place on holiday, had just had a wonderful meal, was sitting back looking at the night sky, probably just had a joint, was marvelling at how wonderful life is and was thinking of his friends and wanted to share that moment with us. I have a message on my phone from last October when he called me after coming out from a doctor and again the news wasn't good. We chatted for a while 
and towards the end he told me he was going to an ice cream shop to visit him to brighten himself up. Soon after I received a text that said, I just passed that ice cream shop that won the grand prize at the International Ice Cream Competition and had three scoops. As long as they stay open, that cancer has no chance. And there in my phone still is my reply. Yeah, I read a study about it in The Lancet, peer reviewed and all. <laughs> and now ironically, The Lancet will be publishing a tribute to Alan in recognition of his contribution to the global response to HIV. Alan made the most of what remained of his life. He and Luke went on that last trip knowing it was risky, but he wanted to go. He wanted one more of his grand journeys. In particular, he wanted the opportunity to spend time with his family and friends. And so there was the special chance for his family to gather together in Scotland. His parents, Doris and Alan, his brother Stephen and wife Pauline, and his nieces, Isla and Kirsten. We saw those photos on Facebook of that house in the starkly beautiful winter countryside with his family gathered together around the meal table. It was exactly what Alan wanted and it will be something they can cherish forever. On his return and in our last conversation, Alan spoke of soon finishing work and of how he wanted to deal with what he thought were the remaining 12 months of his life. He said he wanted to give each of his friends a special treat a trip or a visit to some place special that they'd always wanted to go, and which he could take them on and share with them. And again, it made me think about what a remarkable man he was and how typical of him to plan things this way. Then abruptly, Alan's future disappeared. He died suddenly and in ways neither he nor we expected. It was a hard death, it was distressing, it placed Luke in the terrible situation of having to suddenly manage Alan's care and struggle with a clumsy medical and hospital system at the very moment when he most wanted to spend quiet and intimate time with Alan and then to have those times forever after as memories. It was a week of farewells as people came from across the country and called from across the globe. Susie and her partner Ali from London, Tony Keenan from Turkey, his dear friend and housemate Rob Lake made it back in time from Bangkok. Alan's parents were there and we, his friends, were able to try to share with them in our limited way the unimaginable loss and pain they felt at losing their beloved son. About a year ago, Alan sat with me and spoke of knowing he was going to die. He spoke of wanting to determine how he died. It was a simple conversation. I told him I would support him in whatever he wanted to do and would accompany him as he wished. He spoke of his concern about Luke, about dreading how difficult his death would be for Luke and told me that he didn't want the entire burden to fall upon Luke. When Alan began to die, Luke was quite simply magnificent. Luke describes life with Alan as romantic. The places they travelled to, the restaurants, the concerts, the life of pleasure and adventure that Alan lived so splendidly but always shared in the early days with friends but in the past 15 years with Luke. They had a wonderful life together. They truly loved each other. The greatest tribute to that love and its greatest challenge were those sudden, intense, dreadful days when Alan began to die. Luke was rock solid by his side. Alan was distressed and totally vulnerable and dependent, but he knew Luke was there and he was not alone. Luke was completely absorbed with what was happening for Alan. He knew what Alan was thinking, feeling and wanting. He fought for him, he sought to protect him and to give him comfort and release. Luke tells the story of when he first met Alan at a party in Adelaide, of standing for a long time and pleasantly talking away as people do with strangers at a party. And only at the very end when they touched did Luke experience a physical shock and realise he had just met someone special and it was the beginning of their relationship. I walked into Alan's hospital room just after he died. Luke was sitting beside Alan and we sat in silence for some time. 
Then Luke turned to me and with awe and tenderness quietly said that just as he had leant over Alan to kiss him, Alan had at that moment died and breathed his final breath onto Luke's face and that Luke felt that breath brush across his skin. I apologise to Luke if I've told her something deeply private and intimate, but I needed to tell that story. Alan was a wonderful man and he led a great life. His last moment was truly beautiful, just as he deserved. Thank you. Our next speaker is Luke, uh, Luke Cutler, uh, Alan's much-loved partner for the last 15 years. Together they, made, together they made a formidable team, uh, whether it was supporting many community organisations through their regular volunteer work, travelling the globe on exotic adventures or making a wonderful lives for themselves here in Sydney. Uh, I'd like to invite Luke to speak about the man that he knew and that he loved. That's not going to be easy to follow. Thank you, Bill. Um, I do not share Alan's great talent for public speaking. I shall be brief and I will do my best and hopefully I won't embarrass Alan. Alan and I didn't talk very much about his funeral plans and death. We talked about living a lot. But he did say he didn't want a lot of, lot of speeches. Well, in death, just as in life, you don't always get what you want. <laughs> And, um, and I'd like to thank all of the speakers today because they've just illuminated so much about Alan. Uh, it's very, very beautiful. Um, I'd also like to share a little secret. Um, Alan was concerned about his legacy. Um, whether he, he loved his life work, but he was concerned whether it was of lasting value and it would be remembered. I think today his, um, we've shown his fears are, were unfounded. All the music today, the music you heard as you, as, um, as you came in and um, the next track, next two tracks and the music in the next room are all from Alan's iPod which um, contains 111,000 tracks. So it has been difficult to, to make selections but some of it has been chosen by Alan which made things a little bit easier. Um, after I finished, we're going to be so showing um, something on the on the on the screen so this is something which Alan would do for rela for relaxation he would uh, go down to his his man shed at the bottom of our garden and he would um, choose a bunch of of photos he'd put them on random display and he would listen to music and he would let his mind wander and that is something which he said he wanted to happen at his funeral and we did it at the funeral and we're going to re repeat it today um, when I went to look at the photos, there were some, you know, two and a half thousand photos on his computer. Um, but then I, I picked up his camera, um, which have all the photographs he took on our last big seven week trip, which we only returned from four weeks before he died. And all the photographs are from that trip. Um, and on that tour, we went to um, new places. Alan showed me places which he wanted to share with me and we saw many, many great close friends of Alan and, and myself, including Robin and Suze. Alan was very brave. He was determined to have one last trip before he died. He knew the risks which were involved and they were considerable, but he never wasted a second of his life. Alan knew how to live well. Just before the slides, I just want to talk about the flowers. They are beautiful and unconventional, just like Alan. They, they are yellow for reason, clarity and truth. There are daisies for loyalty, purity and innocence. The orchids represent strength and intelligence. The magnolia stems are for perseverance and dignity, and the tulips are for perfect love. 
Alan and I would say, not perfect, but pretty bloody good. And I have been unable to find a flower which says that. <laughs> and the, um, the orange roses, they say, I am proud of you. And there are red hot pokers. <laughs> They were a surprise at the funeral. I didn't manage a joke. Um, and one more thing before the slides. Um, yesterday was Alan's birthday. He would have been 52. And there's a very special person in the front row here, Doris, Alan's mother, who 52 years ago gave us all Alan. Thank you. You join me. <laughs> so the music for the slides was chosen by Alan. It's called Spiegel and Spiegel, Mirror on Mirror. And it is a time for reflection. Thank you.
Our final, sp our final speaker this afternoon is Dr Bridget Hare, the President of the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations. Bridget met Alan in the mid-1990s and they became friends during the 1996 AIDS conference, arguing on a Vancouver rooftop about the promises and pitfalls of the then new breakthroughs in HIV treatment. They worked together in a variety of roles for over the next 19 years. Today, Bridget is representing AFEO, an organisation that Alan worked with directly in the late 1990s, but with whom he worked with collaboratively for several decades. Thanks. Good afternoon. I think that many of us here today have been to too many funerals and too many memorial services for extraordinary young men and some young women who died before they had a chance to realise their potential. And Alan died young, and he died way too young. But today is different, to me at least, in that Alan achieved so much in the short time that he had. As we've heard from Daryl and Bill, and, and Bill, um, <laughs> useful there, um, Alan was the president of NAPWA, the National Association of People Living with HIV, in 1996 and 1997, the years that marked the turnaround for people with HIV, particularly in Australia with effective new treatments. And this was a time of great energy and of heated debate about how best to communicate these breakthroughs to people with HIV and to get people onto the best drug combinations and to support them in taking what were outrageously complicated um, regimens without recourse to bullying or to patronising. Now, Alan was committed to effective community-based education processes and he championed the bringing together of Australia's two peak community organisations, the National Association of People Living with HIV and of FAO, the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations, to make sure that the task of educating positive people about treatment issues was given the priority and the resourcing that it required. As we've heard, this resulted in the Positive Information and Education Project, a project that placed HIV positive people at the centre of the community HIV response and saw serious resources being allocated to treatment adherence, education and support. And Tim Leach is here in the audience today and he was very much a part of that too. Alan chaired this project and he was fiercely determined to ensure the active partnership with positive people and their representative organisations at every level. We've heard the word fierce a couple of times today. Bill Whitaker used it, Daryl O'Donnell used it, I'm using it again. As anyone who has ever worked with Alan can attest, he could indeed be fierce. And this is far from the first time he's had me crying in public. <laughs> Alan's commitment to social justice was also indefatigable. In 1997, I vividly remember him opening the third international conference on the biopsychosocial aspects of AIDS um, in Melbourne with a brilliant speech on new treatments, inequity and the global PLWHA, PLWHA movement, where he articulated the moral impossibility of accepting that some people with HIV could accept this new lease on life while others would be doomed by the accident of where they were born. Now, critiquing the global injustice of treatment access was to become ubiquitous after about 2000, but in 1997, it was absolutely thrilling to hear these issues being addressed on the Australian stage by Alan. And I was sitting next to Megan Nicholson, who was another old colleague in the auditorium, and she whispered to me that hearing Alan speak made her feel so happy and so proud to be part of the community HIV sector. In addition to bringing AFEO and NAPWA into working together as a partnership, which was no small task, I might add, Alan's NAPWA presidency was marked by the collaborations that he forged with Aboriginal people living with or at risk of HIV. Working closely with Aboriginal colleagues, including Neville Fazula and the late uh, Rodney Younger Williams, to facilitate collaboration with existing community structures and to support the development of a specific Aboriginal response. And again, Alan's work here was exemplary in that he understood that Aboriginal HIV issues needed to be situated within a broader framework of dispossession, land, and culture. And he ensured that the programming of the 2000 Joint Social Research and Educators Conference on HIV reflected this, another incredible achievement. 
Shortly after his NAPA presidency, Alan returned to paid work in the HIV community sector. A brief stint working in policy in, at AFAO, followed by managing gay men's education at the Victorian AIDS Councils in the tumultuous 1990s. It was not an easy time to be working there. And then leading the AFAO NAPA education team at AFAO. And I think it's fair to note that the effective collaboration between AFAO and NAPWA was an absolute priority for Alan and something that he worked very hard to achieve. And for much of this period, he was on a whole range of national committees, as you've heard, further honing his already impressive skills in policy and advocacy, including contribution as a writer of the fourth national HIV um, strategy. So this work served as a kind of jump off point for Alan both nationally and internationally. As we've heard, he went on to work at AXA, um, where he happily met Luke. He worked again at ACON and the New South Wales Department of Health, as has been um, spoken about beautifully by Daryl before departing Australian shores for the UK, where, as we've heard from Susie and Robin, he made a massive contribution to the international um, work and had a global focus in the way that he was working in the UK. Um, his work included um, working with men who had sex with men, with sex workers, with transgendered people, and even women who have sex with women. At the International AIDS Society, the organisation that we know um, through the, uh, the international AIDS extravaganzas every couple of years, Alan had the daunting role of managing communications policy and research promotion. But we know that international AIDS conferences had a special part in Alan's heart. Those of us who were at the AFAO Members Forum from 2014 will remember as he treated us to a racy memoir of the many and varied partnerships that he formed and some of the extraordinary networking activities that he engaged in while, while representing our um, national HIV response. Now, it would probably be unseemly here for me to try to do justice to the scintillating personal revelations that Alan made and the sheer artistry of that talk. Suffice it to say that cage dancing at a Vancouver nightclub with me, uh, we were in adjacent cages, um, nothing nothing too intimate, not sharing, didn't rate a mention. <laughs> Though to me it was something of a highlight of that conference. At the time of his death, as you know, Alan was once more working at ACON in a senior management role and bringing his own unique brand of passion, erudition and occasional unavoidable ferocity to his work. It's a daunting task to try to pay tribute to a man whose work has, has so pervaded the uh, HIV response in Australia and indeed globally. I hope that in talking about Alan's achievements and his influence in this sphere that we as a community can offer some support to Alan's partner Luke and to his family and to his intimate friends by letting them know that we collectively do recognise Alan as an exceptional man, the man that he was and that we appreciate the contribution that he made to the HIV response, that we did notice, and that we will remember. The final song that we're going to hear today is again from Alan's iPod, which I actually associate a little more with Dolly Parton, but um, it's from the great Portuguese Fado star Maritza. Alan travelled to Lisbon, especially to hear Maritza sing at the famous Tower of Balaam concerts. And this song is from one of those concerts. It's been chosen by Alan's good friends, the twins John and Joe Lusk, who share Alan's fondness um, and love of world music. Now, while this song is playing, we get to engage in a community-based activity. You're going to be given an envelope with photographs of Alan, and each, each one is going to contain several different photographs. This is an opportunity for you to open your envelope, to look at the photographs, and to swap them if you don't like what you've got. Check out what your neighbour has. They may have something better than you. This is, this is a way of us all interacting, of us appreciating and, and feeling um, you know, Alan's presence here amongst us and um, also making sure you don't leave with something a little less than what somebody else has got. I'd like to thank you all very much from, for coming here today. I'd like to invite you all, please, to stay, to have some refreshments, to have a drink, to have a talk, and to share photographs and memories of Alan. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to uh, join us in the club room for some refreshments, it's just through the doors here. Thank you.